beginning of history, through the biblical times of Tubal Cain up to the days of the village blacksmith, men have practiced the art of forging. It is only during the past few decades, however, that forging has made its greatest stride. its heavy press program, the United States Air Force has played an outstanding part in making those strides possible. The story of the program begins with World War II. In February 1944, Germany was receiving its worst air drubbing of the war. Day after day, her aircraft were being shot down in great numbers. Her aircraft industry, we knew, was facing drastic shortages of men and material. And yet, as fast as we shot her planes down, more and more appeared to take their place. Where were they coming from? How was she doing? A partial answer to her production success was soon uncovered. The wreckage of a crashed Messerschmitt revealed that in the design and fabrication, unusual techniques had been used. The aircraft contained large components which could only have been produced by huge forging and extrusion presses. For this forged centerpiece, for example, only five parts were used. Had it been built up by the old bits and pieces method, it would have contained 18 parts, consuming hundreds of man and machine hours. For instance, the overlapping for joints and the boring of holes for rivets and bolts was not only a waste of material, but required far more skilled labor. One of the reasons for Germany's advanced techniques was that prior to World War II, she was faced with a shortage of iron and steel, as well as manpower. Therefore, she was forced to come up with improved methods of working light metals, in particular magnesium, and found them in hydraulic forging and extrusion presses. In order to learn more about their presses, a team of American industrial consultants was sent into Germany on the heels of tactical units to make a detailed study of her heavy industry. The visit confirmed the German superiority in forging and extrusion equipment. In the United States, it was not until 1946 that we had our first really heavy press, an 18,000-ton forging press designed and constructed by the Mesta Machine Company. Experience with this press, along with four which we acquired from Germany after the war as reparations, convinced American authorities that the bits and pieces method was a thing of the past. Then suddenly, in June 1950, the Korean War broke out. This fact, coupled with our knowledge that the Russians had walked off with several large German presses about 1946, including the world's largest press at that time, a 33,000-ton giant, gave this country the necessary impetus to embark on a heavy press program. The munitions board endorsed this heavy press program within a month after the Korean War started, and by the outset of 1951, the Air Materiel Command was directed by headquarters United States Air Force to procure the necessary number of heavy forging and extrusion presses. To show some of the basic differences between the two processes, here is first a stylized rendering of an extrusion press. A billet preheated to the proper temperature is loaded into the container at the mouth of which is a die containing an orifice of the desired shape. The pressing stem then moves forward under great hydraulic pressure and squeezes the metal through the die. The severe metal flow which occurs during this process creates a fine-grained rock product with close dimensional tolerance and uniformly high mechanical properties. In the other process, closed die forging, a preheated billet is placed in the lower die. The press closes and under tremendous pressure squeezes the metal into every cavity of both upper and lower dies. The result is a duplicate of the die's configuration. In 1951, our program called for 22 heavy presses. This included the 18,000-ton Mesta already built, the four we had acquired from Germany, plus the building of 17 new ones, nine forging and eight extrusion presses. 
this program was actually started. However, by 1953, owing to various emergencies, rising costs and so forth, it was felt necessary to cut the program to the construction of only four forging and seven extrusion presses. This represented an outlay of $235 million. Naturally, this amount was not to be spent on presses alone. In fact, a large portion of it would be consumed by such items as buildings, furnaces, machine tools, and other supporting facilities. By this time, real progress had been made, but most of the actual construction was still ahead. Most of the factories in this country, which could turn out the huge castings essential for heavy press construction, were booked far ahead. So we had to place some orders with qualified factories abroad. Even as orders were placed, excavation had begun. The Wyman-Gordon installation provides a good example of some of the problems encountered. The choice of this location was dictated by the fact that an Air Force press plant was already in existence here, although a serious problem was presented by the site itself. The water table was only 12 feet below the surface and would have to be lowered temporarily to prevent cave-ins and inundations during excavation. The foundations for the huge presses had to rest upon solid bed rock over 100 feet below the Earth's surface. To lower the water table to this depth called for the sinking of well points. The water then had to be pumped into the nearby lake faster than it seeped back into the excavation. This meant dealing with upwards of 3 million gallons a day. Once the 13-foot thick concrete foundation walls were in, they acted as an underground dam. The water table resumed its normal level, and the two foundations, over 100 feet deep, remained dry. At this time, parts for the press itself began arriving from abroad. This crossbeam made in England weighed almost 200 tons. These side cylinder supports from France, approximately 90 tons apiece. This column, one of 30 such parts for the two presses made by Bethlehem Steel, measured over 100 feet. In conveying these giant parts to the press site, some truly formidable transportation problems had to be solved. Special railroad cars had to be built and special routes devised. With most of the parts finally on hand, assembly of the presses got underway. It was necessary to design unique cranes and tools to handle these enormous components. When completed, this super heavy forging press contained components made in countries halfway around the world. England, Scotland, France, Italy, and Japan. Meanwhile, at the Kaiser Aluminum Company in Maryland, construction of the first two all-American-built extrusion presses was beginning. These foundations measure 125 feet in overall length. The presses were being built by the Loewe Construction Company. To house these two new presses and others to come, the Air Force undertook a gigantic building program. At Hale Fort, Maryland, this building alone covers 350,000 square feet. Two more presses were under construction at the Air Force plant leased to the Aluminum Company of America at Cleveland, Ohio. These were to be a 35,000-ton forging press designed and constructed by the United Engineering and Foundry Company and one of 50,000 tons by the Mesta Machine Company. Also at the Air Force plant operated by Curtis Wright in Buffalo, New York, foundations for another powerful extrusion press were being laid. This, a 12,000-tonner. A strong contributing factor to the success of the program was this first heavy press purchased by the Air Force, the German 14,000-ton extrusion press. Leased to the Alcoa Company in Lafayette, Indiana, it went into production in 1953. Because of its size, this press requires special supporting facilities. For instance, the extra-large dies require special machines to cut them, like this saw, especially designed for the difficult operation. The operator sitting on top of the machine carefully watches the saw blade in a mirror, 
guiding it as it cuts the orifice in the huge die below him. To get back to the extrusion process, the preheated billet is lifted from the heating station, placed on a conveyor, and fed automatically into the press. Because of the tremendously high pressures generated by the thrust of the press, these containers must be exceptionally strong, with balls as much as two feet thick. We are now ready to extrude a piece of integrally stiffened skin. As the operator starts the press, the container receives a dummy block. The ram then moves forward and starts squeezing the billet through the die. The final result is the extrusion of a piece of integrally stiffened skin over 80 feet long. Subsequent required heat treatment can cause distortion of these extrusions. This three million pound shape stretcher, another of the hundreds of supporting facilities required by heavy presses, removes such distortions and improves physical properties by actually stretching the extrusion. Compare this process to the earlier stiffened skin construction, whose many different parts had to be manufactured separately and assembled by hand. The integrally stiffened skin is not only far more economical in production, it is also structurally much stronger when it takes its place in the airplane. In March of 1955, the first of the super-heavy forging presses went into production at the Wyman Gordon Air Force plant. This press table, or platen, upon which the forging is made, is large enough to park four passenger cars. The total weight of the press, over 11,000 tons, equals that of one light cruiser, while its moving parts equal the weight of 3,000 automobiles. This model gives an idea of the total height of the press, which is approximately that of an 11-story building, of which only the upper third is visible above ground. To visualize the great size of the supporting facilities needed to feed these huge presses, let's follow the vast amount of work and planning it takes for the press to forge a wing spar, a component now being produced for the Convair F-102A. Spar material arrives at the plant in bars of aluminum alloy, weighing over a ton, and is then sawed into appropriate lengths. After heating and working to improve its physical properties, the billet, now beginning to take the desired shape, is placed in this furnace and heated to about 800 degrees. Then it is taken to this 7,700 ton press for upsetting. In forging, Upsetting is performed when certain parts of a section call for a greater concentration of stock. Here, the first upset has been accomplished and the second is in progress. This plunger compresses the metal, forming a predetermined bulge or upset. After again being heated, the piece is further worked in another press. Each step brings it closer to the rough outline of a wing spar. Now at the big press for the first time, the rough forging is placed in the blocker dies and finally begins to take the crude shape of the spar. After it undergoes further inspection, it will be heated for final forging. Meanwhile, the finishing dies required for final forging and weighing approximately 33 tons are heated and transferred to the press table. The lower die is fastened to the table, which is then run in. The upper platen will then be lowered and the upper die clamped to it. These mammoth dies have an interesting background of their own. When a blueprint arrives calling for a certain die, an accurate wooden model of the forging is first made. From this model, checked for dimensional accuracy, a plastic cast is made which duplicates the impression called for in the die. 
At the same time, raw pieces of hardened and forged steel blocks are conveyed to a gigantic milling machine. This machine smooths and squares up the face of the block and cuts a shank slot into it. After milling, the block and the plastic master meet at the die sinking machine. Here, contours of the plastic master are reproduced in the steel die block by automatic movements of the cutting tool, controlled by a tracer mechanism in contact with the plastic model. After the die has been cut, all cutter marks are removed by grinding. The dies are again inspected, and meeting specifications are okayed for use. Complementing each of the heavy presses is another important supporting facility, the hydro-pneumatic accumulator station. This supplies the tremendous hydraulic power needed to operate the giant presses. Water in these accumulator bottles is compressed to a pressure of about 4,500 pounds per square inch. This is later increased by the intensifiers to a pressure of nearly 7,000 pounds per square inch at the time when the big press is called upon to give the final forging a 50,000 ton squeeze. In spite of this enormous power, the controls are so delicate that the operator can control the press movement to the fraction of an inch. After the big squeeze, the press is opened and the finished spar forging is brought out for immediate inspection. This particular piece is over 100 inches long, up to 18 inches wide, and in some areas only 3 sixteenths of an inch thick. Once the graphite is removed by chemical baths, the forging is given a final heat treatment to improve its physical properties. After machining, this forged spar arrives at the aircraft factory, where along with three others, it is installed in the wing of an F-102A. These spars represent a saving of some 600 hours of machining and almost a ton of raw material per plane. They also eliminate over 200 parts and thousands of rivets. In addition, the structure weighs 120 pounds less than one made by bits and pieces, and it is considerably stronger. In actual dollars and cents, the forged wing spars represent a saving of over $4,000 per plane. Using forged bulkheads, fin spars, and other forged components in the F-102A saves us a total of nearly $20,000 per plane in this one type of aircraft alone. In 1955, two 8,000-ton all-American-built extrusion presses leased to the Kaiser Aluminum Company went into production. These presses are almost entirely mechanized. The preheated billet comes from induction heating furnaces and along with the dummy block is delivered to the press container by hydraulically operated loading devices. is ready to extrude, water under tremendous pressure is admitted to the cylinders of the press and the stem moves forward into the container. An 8,000 ton thrust squeezes the hot billet through the die onto the runout table. This particular extrusion is a wing spar cap. It will be heat treated, stretched to remove distortions, reinspected, and shipped away for finish machining. During this same period in 1955, the program took a further stride forward when another super heavy forging press went into production. This Goliath, a 50,000 ton unit, was designed and built by Mesta and leased to the Aluminum Company of America at Cleveland, Ohio. To get some idea of its tremendous squeezing power, suppose we follow the final forging of a support fitting for the Boeing B-52 landing gear. Like all other forgings, this one has been heated, shaped, reheated, 
blocked and heated again before it is brought to the press for this final forging. Before being positioned in the dies, the forging is sprayed, although the height is... When the finished forging is removed, it is examined for adherence to thickness tolerance. Due to the close tolerance made possible by this type of press, only 85 pounds need be machined off of the finished forging. Quite a difference from the older forging method, where we had a material waste of over 1,300 pounds. This particular fitting is one of two in each bulkhead of a B-52. When we realize that in turn each B-52 has two such bulkheads, it is obvious that the savings are truly impressive. In addition, this type of forging, due to grain flow control, makes the entire support fitting considerably stronger. With the increasing speeds of today's military aircraft and consequent frictional heating, aluminum is rapidly approaching its useful limit. Manufacturers of tomorrow's aircraft are turning to materials which will retain their strength at higher temperatures. For the moment, steel or titanium is the answer. The Air Force is well aware of these developments, as witnessed the 12,000 ton extrusion press which went into operation in 1955 at the Air Force plant at Buffalo, operated by Curtis Wright. This press and plant were specifically designed to extrude steel and titanium. The extrusion of these metals poses added problems in that the process calls for greatly increased temperatures. When thoroughly heated, the billet must be quickly conveyed to the press. is the much higher extrusion speed. Completing the current heavy press program are two other Air Force owned presses. One, an 8,000 ton unit built by the Lowy Construction Company went into operation late in 1956. The other, a 12,000 tonner built by the Lombard Corporation. Both are leased to the Harvey Aluminum Company in California. These powerful presses are more than machines for national defense. In the capable hands of American industry, they present a great national economic potential. They can squeeze out heavy components for consumer use, such as forged automobile wheels and engine parts, weather-resistant structural members, architectural items, truck flooring, large one-piece truck members, along with structural members for ships. And these are but a few of the items our presses can produce. Their commercial application is limited only by the ingenuity of design engineers. Born of necessity and nursed through its growing pains by sheer determination, the heavy press program has raised our country from a low-rated position in this field to the number one spot. By 1955, we had surpassed all other nations, including Russia. As weapons of defense, as powerful tools of industry, our heavy presses are a potent factor in our program of peace through global superiority. <laughs>